Hey everybody, I just, I always feel like just quitting after that introduction because I can't follow it. And I have like this cold sore I've gotten because of this weather and all it reminds me of is that scene from Spinal Tap where they're standing with their herpes sores. Oh, God. <laughs> it's just killing me. But this is actually a very, not a special episode, but we don't get to do these much anymore. We become very guest-centric, Dan. We have Paul with us, gladly. Hey, everybody. And in the peanut gallery, we have our fifth beetle, Jill. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, since she appreciates being the fifth beetle, she's going to sit there and probably go through their catalog because she loves them. During this whole thing. She'll, she'll be watching. Uh, yeah. But it. we're actually going to just talk about, we don't get to do our bull sessions much. We're just going to talk about, this is sort of a state of the carnival show because of where we've come from, what's going to be coming up. We'll talk a little bit about the guests. We'll talk about some, maybe some colonoscopy prep stories. Uh, please, no. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> what does it feel like, though? You can at least say that. Like, okay, what a friend of mine I, said. I've blocked it out. I've completely blocked it out. Okay, that's one of those. There's a friend of mine said, imagine like drinking a bottle of gin and having a garbage plate. Yeah. And I've had a, I've had a day after garbage plate after coming home and not even being in kitchen to have it. That was pure hell for a day or two. You ever done that? Like when you bring it home, or you're too spaced out, you leave it, and the next it's all congealed and greased. I've never had a leftover garbage plate because I've always inhaled them. I, I, you know, garbage plate is a serving size to me. That's not. That's there are no leftovers. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I, I've it, always had a very take no prisoners attitude. Have you ever had the plates. food poisoning one though? Where I had the one as my friend Liz and I, we used to work at the corner, and like we had our late nights on Tuesday, we close up, go out for plates and stuff, and I had one. And I got home, I started getting the sweats. And you, you don't, you don't not, you do not have an iron constitution, Rob. Because I, I know, you know, I'm, I don't know. Jill, vouch for me here. I, I can pretty much eat anything. Yeah, you, you can. Pretty much. I love it. It's like, like I, I'm, I'm waiting for the dog to throw down the challenge. Like, okay, eat this. I'll eat this. I'll roll in this. I need it. I had a cousin who ate those liver snaps when we were kids. Oh, I <laughs> so so a friend of mine had his mom would always have little bowls of treats out on the on the sideboard in, in her house when we'd go over. And so one day we went over after school and, and I was like, Oh, these are really good. They're like meat flavored. What are they? And and she's like, That's the cat's bowl, they're li- they're liver snaps. Oh, okay. And I'm like, Can I have another? <laughs> she had me she had me rolling over and I don't like, like, on Facebook or anything else, all that nostalgia stuff, but there's always, well, you know, what? remember when we grew up, we were a lot tougher, we were just, it's like George Carlin's thing, I, swove, I swam in the Hudson River and all the slush and everything, I'm fine, nothing's gonna touch me. Yeah, we used to swim in the Birch Canal. Yeah, and remember all that stuff, you go to the deli or something, just grab it with their hands, yeah. and like coughing, and everything else. That which does not kill us, we'll eat yes. for breakfast. But I want to address one thing here, too. Greg hasn't been with us for a while, and we're not going to talk personal stuff. Though. He's going through some things right now. We wish him the best. Hopefully, he loves this show, and he can't wait to be back. A couple times, we have to keep him home because he wants to be on so much. But he's without Greg, we wouldn't have a show, and we're just wishing him well. And he'll be back soon enough so we can torment him and pretend we that's, don't like him. That's right. Yeah. Well, act like he was never. Yeah. Ever that's but he's if you haven't seen Greg for a bit like on our Zooms or here, that's just because he's going through some things. So, and we have other drummers to pick on, but he's our most liked. And there wouldn't be a show without him. So I hope he doesn't listen to this cuz I have to pretend I hate him. So. <laughs> but we miss you, Greg. Yeah. And get well, please, okay? I don't have a drummer to my left. It's very odd. It feels unbalanced here, Rob. I don't know what it is. It's You just want to feel smarter than somebody. <laughs> make, make jokes about the average IQ of the room went up because there's no drummer here. <laughs> <laughs> I had three of them in here one time. I was like Stephen freaking Hawking. <laughs> well, the first show I was on, we were just talking about this in the car on the way over here this morning. And, and the first show I was on, we had two drummers in me. And yeah, John uh, Eric. Yeah, John was here. And and um, uh, it, it was about a year ago because he was talking about the, he had his first gig coming up in 500 and something days. It was last July 21st. I yeah. remember the day. And, and uh, But, yeah, I got to meet John on that show and, yeah, that's, and Greg. So, you know, that's the thing I did want to talk about a little bit about this show. It's going really, really well, and I want to thank everybody. I never thought sometimes it's like a little acorn you just do on a lark. starts off 
not really happy with the way it was at first, but you learn and you grow. And like, I think after you do it, you find where you're supposed to be in it. And people like being on and like doing it. And I will admit, like for Carnival of Randomness, guess who I know? Pretty much 90% musicians. So it's Carnival of Random Musicians, except when we get to do these BS sessions. And of course, we have Kat, our beloved uh, comic book artist and in-house artist who I can Zoom with now because she's in Portland. And she did a Beatles show, too, when we were on. So... No comment. <laughs> She's a big Beatles fan, but we're also trying because, I mean, also, remember, when we deal with creative people, their schedules can be really tough. And we can get, we try to fit them in on our schedule here. We can do differences in the studio, different days possibly. And we do try to do our Zoom because as yet, we're doing a Patreon or a GoFundMe if you want for our own private jet to fly guests in if you'd like to contribute. <laughs> I'll, I'll contribute to the bar fund for that jet. Yeah, we're going to have a private bar. It's going to be modeled after the Starship from Led Zeppelin. I think what's going to end up happening, Rob, is we'll just end up with a private bar and no jet. Either that or... (laughs) Either that when Greg's better, what we'll just do is we'll send him off like four days, like if some guest is in California. He can go drive and pick him up, bring him up here, come back. We'll do that. Sure. But those are going well, too. You know, there's always little kinks in them sometimes. But and I, the studio is the home ship. I mean, this is the place. But what can you do? There's people all over the country now. We need a mobile unit. We need to be like ghost hunters. You know, get our own black vans. Get Andy in a, in a mobile sound unit and, and go to where the guests are. And we have some really good guests coming up. A lot of musicians again. But we also talk. Eventually, we might get one in front of somebody Paul knows if you want to just talk about her a little bit. Oh sure, yeah. So Laura Turner. Just to pressure her to be on because we mentioned her. <laughs> yeah, we and uh, we've we've talked about branching out in the show, and you know Rob's really gifted at finding incredibly, insanely talented uh, young people. And Laura is a, a Jill's cousin in England, and she's uh, a playwright, s- screenwriter, actor, director, and um, I just sent Rob a, a screen capture of her bio on on. Um, on uh, Facebook uh, for one of the the one of the shows that she's got starting at the Fury Theater in, in England uh, this year, but uh, and, it's and it's and it's streamed yeah. But anyway, th- th- her bio mentioned all of these roles that she's been in these short films and everything. It completely missed Lapwing, which is the film that she wrote, her first film that she wrote and, and co-directed um, recently in England. But we're looking to do a Zoom with Laura because again, she's insanely talented. Um, she's um, energetic. She's a good interview and. Uh, She'd fit right in the the chemistry of the show, even though she's not a musician. Which, which is good. Well, 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 she, you know, there's still time in her which life is, to become a musician. She'll probably be one of those. She'll just take it up as a hobby. hobby and then, but no, we need a, we do need a little diversity like that. I have a lot of artist friends, but you have to understand, artist friends and theater friends especially tend to be very very busy on their schedule. They're always rehearsing, doing something. So and we're always really thankful for bringing people in. You know, that they can come in and they and they enjoy being on here. Everybody really does. They, you know, I always volunteer to buy them ice cream at Burn Dairy afterwards. I used to do that when we started. Oh, really? Yeah. I was wondering where the milkshake reference came from. So Rob was asking if uh, Laura would do it for a milkshake. And I said, sure, she would. She seems like a no, milkshake No, that was just off the top of my head. That wasn't anything <laughs> special or anything. But, you know, that's like, but also I'm going to have, we did, you know, you've, I don't know, you weren't on these, you were Zoom, but we did our carnival around the world. Well, we did because I have a, my friend Vicky Romler, a friend of Andy's. She's been in the studio. She's in France, and we did one from Fran- Paris with her. That was before my time. Yeah, I I, I might have been. You like, might have seen it was no. Zoom. I might have been like three or four at the time he did that one. Yeah. Oh, now he's learned how to be part of the show for good. And I have a friend Jenny Drag. She was the lead singer. Of the she's the lead singer of the Priscilla. She knows all the knows Captain Sensible, all these cool punk new wave guys. Always puts these great pictures of hanging out with like these characters. And she's fun. And of course, we have to do the time changes and stuff. But one thing I was going to ask you: How did this, I know you said you did some work in Syracuse in music? How did you actually get into all the music stuff and get addicted to this? Okay, <laughs> work in music. That's really generous. So, so my first job. In high You're school. technically working in music. Yeah, working in music. My first job in Syracuse was I worked. I worked at MacArthur Stadium selling um, uh, popcorn and soda, walking up and down the, the the bleachers and the stands of the baseball games. And and the same people that do that end up be, being the beer guys at the hockey games and the t-shirt guys and the merch guys at the rock concerts. So um, so because I was I was working at concerts, I every concert from 1970. 
five onwards. Um, uh, I'm dating myself here. God, I'm breaking the rules of the show. Uh, so I, <laughs> we I, time I, travel on the I, show. Too, I saw, so you traveled I, back. I, in I traveled time. back in time to see those shows, and um, yeah. So I, I just I was at every live event at the War Memorial, at the Carrier Dome, at at, at the uh, Coliseum, at the fairgrounds, the grandstand at the fairgrounds. So I got to see every every live show in Syracuse for years, you know, all the way through college. Was like- and 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 then and then worked in theater in Rochester, right? So so uh, worked at the Eastman, um, worked in opera theater. Um, because Eastman's a a union shop, I had to be a union card holder. So then I got um, I was working at the Hollander Stadium shows the year before the year before they tore it down. I got to work all of those shows setting up the stages for the police and and uh, and so on. So it's I got to work follow spots for Ozzy. That was police, Ozzy. flock of seagulls, and the fix, right? And the fix, the fix, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Because they only, how flock many? Flock of haircuts. <laughs> oh, those. <laughs> flock of haircuts, yeah. Those, those guys How many great. shows did they, did, I remember Journey, and I can never forget Journey because I lived in Gates when I was a kid, and I swear, like, you could probably walk to Hollander yeah. from where I lived. You probably hear it from And me. there were two things about it when the, the, the Lancers played there when the Rochester Cosmos played there, and this was big. This is all those guys. Anybody who even dabbled in soccer would know, like Pele, Georgia Canal. If it was like the All Star team, the line of cars we had, we used to have that central driving by us. The line of cars was parked all the way down. And for Journey, it was the same thing. The line was like Journey, Brian Adams, and maybe somebody else. Yeah, I worked that show too. I mean, you made so much on those because uh, you got ship differential if you were there over eight hours, and if you were setting the stage, I think got paid. I made more money doing stage work, like erecting the stage and hanging lights, than I did on my software developer job. So I would take vacation days or, or call in sick and go set up for Hollander. And they would start on Thursday on the, on the setup. The concert would be on Saturday, and then they'd do teardown on Sunday. And so I'd have four days in a row where I was working, and you got it was, it was great pay. It was great now, money. Many, it was a lot of fun. I know there was a Grateful Dead show there. I, I don't remember the Grateful Dead show at Hollander. I remember, I the, I remember the one at Silver Stadium. Yeah, there was yeah. one in Hollander. And I know I had a friend who lived on by LaGrange. I forget. I, there was LaGrange, but there's another street like right across from there. Yep. And he said you could just hear them all. You could hear them. But I do remember because it was a cool shirt because somebody had one. that had the little guy. It was like a different looking shirt for it. But I know they had it at Hollander. It was one show. And, you know, actually you could find out. I was actually Steve Litvak and I were talking. And I said I saw Ian Hunter here like 20 years ago. Right at Water Street, he said, "I can't remember this show because you know, Pete, Pete, and him. They're like Pete's his drummer is like a huge fan. He can't remember. So I go, I don't know when the heck it was. So I actually just looked up Ian Hunter tour, and it had all his tour dates from '75 on. It was Halloween 2000. Wow. See, I you know I was having trouble remembering. <laughs> so I've got a good friend, Stephanie. Hey, Stephanie, feel better. So. She was like, remember when we went to see Neil Young? I'm like, I've never seen Neil Young. She's like, remember we went to see Neil Young? You don't remember going? You and me and Liz went to see Neil Young. We were sitting all the way in the back, and I went to the front of the stage. And I'm like, I, I, did, I couldn't remember this. And I'm like, wait a minute. Was this 1985? There was, <laughs> there, was, there was some missing time. It was when I was abducted by aliens. It was called my Dublin time, was, actually, for yeah, mine. <laughs> I had some missing time in 1985. It was, it's a long story. But anyway... Finally, she she said, "Remember, I went up to the front of the stage, and Neil got through with his harmonica, and he dipped it in a bucket of water, and he and he, he was like blessing the audience with his harmonica. And the guy next to me is like, spit on us, Neil, spit on us.' And I'm like, "Oh God, now I remember that concert, right?' And I went to and I'm trying to remember why did I block this out? I went to setlist.com. Did you ever go to setlist? Yes, yeah, so setlist. That okay, so setlist is awesome for those of you that don't know it. And I found that concert, and it was '85, right?" And it and it was August of eighty five in Rochester, the War Memorial, and he was with the International Harvesters, and I'm like, oh, it was that bluegrass bluegrass crap that I wasn't into at the time. Right now, I love it. Right, of course. That's how we were, though. That, that's how we were, and and I remembered the the last three songs because they played Down by the River and they played uh, Powderfinger. They played an extre- extended long version of Powderfinger, and I remembered the concert. But it was funny because it was it had to be what. Um, you know, time traveling forward again. Many, many years later, we're at a Neil Young uh, video uh, telecast at theaters back when they did these things. So, you know, the the live event where Neil Young's uh, um, doing a an interview panel with people about what was the name of that movie? It was it was uh, uh, 
No, Russ never Russ sleeps. Russ never was, sleeps. Well, that was the, the second movie. But he, You're he, the horse? He, no, he made a movie with Devo. Greendale? And, no, it was like uh, Human Highway or something like that. Hmm. And it was it was this bizarro movie that he made. But they finally <laughs> re they finally re edited it and finished the movie, and they aired the movie, and um, it was it was this great movie. And then they had the cast and the directors and uh, the uh, guys from Devo were were there and, and Neil, and they were talking about the editing of this movie that they started making in the eighties, and they finally finished it like three years ago, four years ago, it was just before oh, COVID. It's, now this question for you and for the audience: Would you have joined Devo if you had to wear those hats? Oh, I would have joined Devo just. We for, did, you know, we did a tribute for, show. The, for the hats and the haircuts because they looked like they looked like Lego peg people in those hats. We had a, at the Bugs Yard. <laughs> we used to do at the Bugs Yard. We would do tribute shows. We didn't do. We don't do as many of them. Obviously, you know, bless the Bugs Yard. They're still around. I'm actually going. Oh, yeah. I'm returning there next week because one of my best friends is playing there, and uh, we do tribute shows. And they did a Devo one. Only Eric Witkowski was the only person, my friend Eric, would, who would wear the hat. <laughs> Nobody else Nobody would do it. You got to wear the hat and the sunglasses. I mean, it's just not. It's just not Devo without. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm lucky. It'd be like the B fifty two without the. Because you remember, I don't know. If, it's probably a like at every high school where you're pegged as whatever. And amazingly, I wasn't like super popular in high school. Somehow, I don't know why. I was like the alternative kid. But uh, you're supposed to like one type of music. You got to be that person. You know, in a lot yeah. of high schools. Like, I went to a suburban Catholic high school, so it was all... Yep. Okay, 70s bands with one name, innocuous people. Journey, Ford, or all that stuff. And I was, uh, you know, I was all in, because my brother, and the reason I got into music was my brother was in a band, New Math. Played at Scorgies, all yep. this stuff. Scorgies. And this, I these to, were I the, go see these were the old days. I used to time oh, travel. Oh, did you see a toddler I used to there? I used to time travel back to... <laughs> I I saw myself at one of those shows once. I, in, 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 have you ever crossed timelines when you go back? Yes. And you see yourself as a toddler, on on Greg Townsend's yeah. shoulders, and yeah. and you have learned well how to be a coach <laughs> on the show. So if you saw a new Mac, that little baby crib on the side, that was you. But the thing was, in those days, nobody cared. I think you'd get kicked out now unless it was an all ages show. And but nobody really cared like that much about ages and stuff. So you, know? you could be there as a toddler. Plus, I was and, like and, somebody's brother yeah. getting in. But that's where I got into that because you know the whole world was. Remember back then, like now, you can go out and find anything. Back then, you, what would you do? There's like some late night music shows you could catch, or you'd have to like just what you do with your friends. And we would go out. Like that was the guitars or Lakeshore Record Exchange was a big one. That guy was, right. and actually his name was Roy Stein, I think. Mm-hmm. Ron Stein. Ron Stein. And yeah. I say I say that with irony because Ron Stein's a friend of mine, not not him, but, but I think he lives in Texas now. But he and he knew like King Diamond and all these guys, so he would bring them in. But he would always like we'd come down on Fridays, go down there, and uh, Todd Kratz did that too. The Kratz man who's been on the show, good friend of mine, and he's uh, you'll love to meet him. That's like a music person. Who's just great again too? But we go down. We go. What do you got for us this week? And he just say, "Okay, we got this. We got this. I got the first. I got the one Zombies album there." Wow. And I would swear, I I would become one of those people. You know, you'd have like the stack. It would be Hank Williams on the bottom. Oh It'd yeah. Be like, you know, something on top, like some. I, see, I. You talked about being pegged as a as a. But we were type. in high school. Well, uh, That's what had, I mean. See, you know, my high school. I don't think we had that sort of. Pigeonholing with uh, I went to I went to uh, an all male Catholic high school right in Syracuse and and uh, and it was I think it was a little different that way because it was more like jocks versus nerds and and uh, and but everybody in our in our class like our class was unusual in that it was not very clicky everybody got on while everybody mingled everybody well, that was like the bizarre and, world but, version of mine I'll but, tell you. yeah it's, it was the opposite <laughs> of yours right and and we we just had a lot of diversity because I had some friends that were. I, I, my friend Jim, Jimbo, uh, was the only white kid in a black urban um, uh, public school growing up, and so he, he was great for like Motown and soul and R and B and you know like deep deep James Brown stuff and and everything. So he was he was great for that. I had other friends that were into disco, and we would go out and dance disco. God, you know that was another time traveling thing. You, you should definitely t- do the disco time travel sometime. I remember all I do know Lost stories. Lost Horizon in Syracuse. I knew to two grand here. I never went to it. There was a place called Two, and I think it was Saturday Night Fever. I think the club the, there wasn't that two thousand and one at the movie because yeah. they used 
all these people like would go to two grand. Yeah. And I just never went there. But I guess there's I never a heard of two grand. My my sister used to go to the seven forty seven club. Which yeah, was, and I, I heard what I heard about seven forty seven was they had like two where one was like rock and one was disco. I might be wrong because I, I never, never went set to foot it. in the place. <laughs> I never went to it. I just heard stories. Sometimes like I get like you hear it's like I was never at the Orange Monkey and the only reason I knew oh, about the Orange, the Orange Monkey, Monkey was great. Was Lou Graham's book. I read about it because he mentions going to the Orange Monkey. The Orange Monkey and the Glass Onion. I remember the Glass Onion. I Yeah. But the, the Orange Monkey was uh, a, f- a good friend of mine. Karen lives out in California now, uh, growing organic food. And, and we were just talking about driving on St. Patrick's Day through a snowstorm to go to the Orange Monkey to see, I think it was New Math um, uh, play back when we were all time traveling back to uh, our, our other college days in the 80s. But... Um, but yeah, I mean, we had some good clubs here. But you know, I think about I think about the types of music that I was exposed to, and I had I had friends that were very diverse in music. I mean, my friend Jim had he had his his record collection at home looked like the vault at WRUR when I was when I was working the radio <laughs> station back in the day. We had we were in the the old WRUR. I think I don't I haven't been to the studio in ages. But back when I was there, the record lockers were the old walk-in coolers for the um, for the for the um, the kitchen. In the uh, dining hall, because Todd Union used to be the dining hall at, on River Campus back in the day, back when it was a small campus, and so our record lockers were literally meat lockers that had that had shelves lining them. It was it was hysterical. But Jim's collection looked like that, so he he was incredibly diverse. He he got me into um, British bass, blues rock, Eric Clapton, and and uh, Cream, and um, and it was back in the day when you know people would hand you cassette tapes of albums, and I would just get. Remember the ta- mixtapes that like you just put on your radio you, you, and just you, record. Yeah, all yeah, the- yeah. And remember Sunday nights here? There was Rockline. There was something else, and there was Doctor Demento. And my parent and I would just sit there. It was on MJQ, and I would just sit there and record. King stuff. Biscuit Flower. King Biscuit Flower. King we Biscuit had, Flower. We had Bruce was... Pilato on the show, and I think he was somebody who produced that. Yeah, and the first time I ever heard um, John Cougar uh, before he he uh, went back to Mellencamp. Uh, first time I ever heard John Cougar, I was sitting in the pub at the U of R. Listening to King Biscuit Flower Hour, drinking a beer, and, and was it and, ain't even done with the night? But hold tight. <laughs> Oh, I, no, I'll never forget I that because I saw him. It was a late night show, but he tried to do the James Brown on that. It's a video, and what he does is he's doing the whole tight. Ain't even dealt with. So they get him. You know, he's coming back to, like they do the James Brown. Thing oh wow, I never grab. saw that. Just, That's interesting. Just look up. Probably ain't even done with the night. I'm sure you could find it anywhere these days. Yeah. But that's when I saw him before when he was just John Cougar. Yeah. But you know we had all these we had all these great opportunities for being exposed to different types of music and I, and especially working all the concerts that I worked at I mean I worked at Tom Jones concert he was in the round women were Everybody throwing underwear it. at the stage it was and it was a great concert right I really enjoyed it um, uh, the worst concert ever was Andy Gibb <laughs> I was deaf because teenage girls were and they trashed the place they stole a whole stack of t-shirts from my merch table I, I was upside down for the night and and we were all deaf from the screaming and it was it was they trashed the place it was back when they had wooden folding chairs they put out for for the floor seating and they the place was destroyed well, I actually i didn't know heather told me her own heather stewart said her mom saw the beatles twice in toronto and she was like about 10 11 12 she's but she said she won the tickets. There was like a contest, and the Beatles weren't that big. But she said that she saw them. You couldn't hear a thing because of the screaming. Yeah, yeah. And they hated it too. They hated it. like I always say. Like some people, just if you could say you saw the Beatles, that's awesome. But if you asked me, I would have said like Kinks, Who, Stones, because the Beatles yeah. concerts are not going to be. You just go in. You wouldn't even like hear anything. Yeah, you're not they, there for the music. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, I think the Who would have just been like the show to see, or, yeah, because they were like, because that's that story about rock and roll there, circus where there was there was no risk of not hearing the Who at a Who concert. There's a risk <laughs> of losing your hearing. <laughs> Jill lost her hearing falling asleep against the stack at the Hawkwind concert, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, okay, I never do. I never do. I know we do or not do. We don't try. We do shows, <laughs> but I don't do number ones. No I don't do number ones because it depends on the. It sounded so freaking wrong. <laughs> it was like Amanda's comment the other week. Well, the first time I did it was in the closet. <laughs> okay, no, we're talking about your music. <laughs> uh, no, okay. I don't do like, okay, what's your all-time? But what is like one of your all-time, like, my ears are killing me, this is too loud shows? 
Oh, God. Oh, uh, I can uh, while I, you're thinking. I, I mean, can do uh, mine. no, it would, be, it would be. I don't have to think too hard. Judas Priest yep. uh, at, at PNC Center uh, about what four years ago. We drove up from Atlantic City. We were on, on holiday, and we How went to see them. How could you see that? Because I saw them on their farewell tour more than 10 years ago. Yeah, but I saw the yeah. Who on like three farewell tours. So. Well, I found out <laughs> Pete, Pete needed the money. Pete needed the money. The show to see wasn't that 82 one. It was the one like in 89, the time, 88, 89. Yeah. I thought that was just a lot better. Yeah, and I missed them on that tour. But everybody, everybody says the same thing. That I, 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 I have some... Dear friends that are really big time who fans. Oh, see, when I saw I saw Judas everything. Priest at the Main Street Armory was Thin Lizzy, you know, just basically Brian Thin Robinson, Lizzie. and it was Zach. I would say Zach Wild was the best guitar player, Black Label Society, and all of them. There were that was Judas Priest, and they lost a little because KK wasn't with them anymore. Mm. I thought there was something a little missing. I, I thought I thought they were phenomenal when we saw them. But they them. were still all uh, good. They, they were. They, I mean, uh, who's? I don't know their guitar player. Right Glenn now, Tipton. But, yes. Thank uh, you. Is he playing? Because I know I read Halford's book, and I guess Glenn's got like some tendon. He's got like some health problems. Um. He, well, he looked pretty healthy when when we saw him. Halford is uh, is just he he so, he just walks around yeah. and uses his microphone like he's baptizing yeah. the, the the band well, the whole I time. Didn't, and I didn't it was, realize it's just very this. Odd, but the music was phenomenal. I didn't realize this. Wow. I read his book. I guess he quit drinking like around 1986, and he had a real real problem. Mm-hmm. So, but I like his one comment because we all know he's gay. Yeah, it's cool. As we always say, but he, what his comment was the best, where he goes, "How could you know? I dressed like one of the village people for over ten years." How could you not know, right? Yeah, he dressed like the the leather cop for from the the village people. But he he's had, got that cane. He's like walking around. He had he had to have had twenty costume changes during that show, and they opened for Deep Purple, which is why we were there, and and uh, Deep Purple was phenomenal. Uh, but oh my god, so we you know we just last minute we got tickets we were the last row under the shell it was supposed to rain that night it turned out to be a nice evening and then we got for 10 bucks we got upgraded uh, 10 bucks each to like 10th row center and i couldn't hear for like three days we went out to a uh, an all-night bar after that um uh right just across the causeway from atlantic city and i i couldn't hear a thing i, See, had, I was never, reading lips they were never <laughs> i've seen them a bunch i saw them on screaming for vengeance defenders of the faith i They've never been for me like when I saw them at the armory. I didn't think they were brutal. Now, brutal, the worst band I've ever seen. I do have a number one, but this is a smaller one at the Bug Jar. Jucifer. <laughs> That's the name, Jucifer. You now, when you hear a name like Jucifer, you know it's going to be kind of loud because you were speakers all over, right? And I literally, my friend Pauline and I were there. I literally like we walked. We had to walk out more than once. Because it was just so, even with the gear plugs, it was just painful. Yeah. And I've heard stories about Motorhead. One time I, I actually parked in the Penny Arcade parking lot, and I listened to it from the parking lot. But the time <coughs> I saw them, they weren't that loud. Now I've, now I've heard ACDC. Motorhead have always been loud. Not the one I went to. I think, and I swear, it was one of those really miserable concerts in a way. Because what happened was, it was at the Penny Arcade. There was like it was raining. There was like a big line. They had all these crappy bands playing before they went on. And I don't know who they were, but they they were just no. And I'm sorry, whoever they are, but sorry, not sorry, you sucked. But I don't know who. <laughs> we're sorry you sucked. No, that's I'll I'll do a segue. My one story on that. Okay, I think if you read it, and remember, like on Facebook, you don't have pressure. I have to entertain every day. Right? <laughs> that's why, like when you put, I was putting set lists from set because I'm going. People expect humor and stories. I can't just put. Well, I did my well, you know, I'm just, updates. But I saw this band, Shiny Toy Guns. Right, so I go in there. Number one, I'm meeting my friend Stephanie there. It's all these younger kids. It's like an alley band. They're like. I don't know what I described them. They were decent, shiny toy guns. I look like a narc. I'm like sitting in the corner, looking all grumpy, like I usually do. And and he's surrounded by all these uh, young uh, yeah. pl- plastic flower children. As yeah, like to call them. I'm yeah. sitting there. So right, so I'm doing that. Whoever the opening band was, I, was, I say that I'm sitting here in tie dye right now. By the way, I got this freaked out. <laughs> you know, I look like with a. I don't want to describe the shirt. Uh, so I, I saw was, that pattern on a diner in the '60s when I time traveled back to the '60s oh. once. So, I'm sitting there, the opening band, they come out, they're wearing like little smocks or something. They're like the worst band I've ever heard. I don't even know their name. So, I couldn't take it for a minute. 
I just all of a sudden I just can't help my subconscious go, this band sucks. Right at a break when it's silent, <laughs> and, everybody, and everybody's like, look, and, I, and, everybody, and I always think, I mean, think, think of the worst band, like the bands, like, like think of bands you hate. There are people out there who that's their favorite band. Yeah. You know, I always say like for my music taste it would be like, you know, the stuff nobody listens to. That's what I listen to. And then we used to always make fun of people being like music stops. Oh, you know, all the stuff that's really bad. That's what the other people listen to. <laughs> well, you know, you, you were talking about Hank Williams. You mentioned Hank Williams being in the record pile at one point. But, you know, I grew up in a, in a house where my mom loved polka music. My dad listened to cowboy music, as he would call it, not Western music. It was it was cowboy my music. My dad uses hillbilly music. Yeah. He would listen to, we'd watch Hee Haw every, every Saturday. I did, too. Yeah, Hee Haw was awesome. And, and you know, I think about, like, you know, my dad grew up in Syracuse. He, he left to go uh, join the Air Force when he was 17, um, went to Japan, Korea War, in the, with the Air Force. But he was training in Texas and Arizona, and that's where the first music he heard when he got out, like, it's like him going to college, right? His influence was country and western music, because that's, that's what he heard when he was a young person breaking away from the family and moving out on his own for There's the first all time. theories and, on that. And, 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 you know, he turned me on to Johnny Cash, and I love him for that forever, because yeah, I, I love Johnny There's Cash. a lot of theories on that, too, I think, that, like, my one friend, Matt, he's like a big metalhead, always been a big mm-hmm. metalhead, and we were talking about music. I made him a gun club CD one time, and he's like, Rob, this music sucks. And they're like, <laughs> and they're like in my top, I actually got a new live gun club album yesterday and uh and he told me look it's like it's what you grow up on that's why i was lucky to have like a little but bit I, of but, but i think it's what you grew up on and i think it's what you rebel against too i think it's what you discover on your own and make your own and it's what your what your friends introduce you to well i, think I is, never would forget because, go, because music's currency yeah. right with 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 young people and that your friends bring you or music like some of my childhood friends. friends were like dude we got to go to the rick springfield concert there'll be a lot of girls there I'm like look at us we don't have a chance <laughs> don't kid yourself in those days <laughs> come on but i always said it's like i've Use this term too. I read Ulysses, like Joyce's Ulysses, when I was a little older. And when the first thing I thought after reading, it took me three weeks. It was miserable. It was basically the Odyssey with a lot of flowery language and sex and pooping and such. <laughs> but and all I remember is the one line, you know you would have gotten an A in, in the literature. And I can quote red, redheaded <laughs> redheaded women women buck like ghosts. I think somebody said it was 800 pages of shitting and fucking. <laughs> basically. But I got through it. It was weird because my friend Nancy and I were having, we had like this weird competition about we're going to read it and I would get back and forth with her. She's like, well, they're just eating breakfast. And I was like, I'm going to do it. it. Took me through. It's like, well, how'd you like it? She's like, I quit. <laughs> I, had to, I, had to, you know, I had to go through it. But I use that because you have to basically, I think if you tried to read it when you were younger, mm. you just go, what the heck? Because yeah. I think you have to have read other things and be familiar. I think, you have I think to, that's what I think, the music... I think you have to live, have lived life, too, I think, you know, to some extent. Because, yeah. because you can't relate otherwise. Yeah. And I think that's partly like it. Because I don't think, like, say you were, like, you know, 15... And you get hit with like avant garde jazz. <laughs> I can't imagine reading Ulysses at fifteen. <laughs> oh, I could. I'd read three pages and I would put the thing down. <laughs> you know how I read Finnegan's Wake, right? I didn't understand one damn thing. It took me years. I even said this is my challenge. I would get up and read a page a day till I finish. No freaking idea what was going on there. And then Martin Gardner, who's one of my favorite science writers, he yeah. actually wrote a. Uh, this book, Night is Large, which I recommend for everybody. The guy's a polymath. He wrote a story about all the word puzzles in Ulysses. And I'm thinking, damned if I could find any of these. Yeah. But, you know, I always celebrate Bloom's Day just because it's, why not? Why not? You know. But, like, his other stuff, like Portrait of an Artist and that stuff's all. But I know, you know, accessible. But I know he loved crosswords and all that kind of stuff. So maybe that was it. But that was like I always used to say, you want to be pretentious if you're a student, go into like a spot coffee with a copy of Ulysses. <laughs> just, just get a... Just, get just the, carry it just, around. Just have the cover of Ulysses and put it around whatever you're reading. <laughs> that way you look like you're deeply into it. It's like I'm reading <laughs> Keith Richards' bio. <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with the Ulysses cover wrapped around it. Oh, I wish I would have known that. I should have done that more in my pretension thing. <laughs> I was telling, like, Katie last I was saying, I had those, yeah, I, we all had our days where I would go to the little theater and look in and go, 
okay, what movie is less than 10 people and no subtitles? That's the only movie I'll go to. It's the only right. good enough movie for my taste. Right. I never had a beret. Okay. Uh, not your top movie, but what's what's the one most memorable movie of of all time that you've seen in any one of the little theaters? Wow, I don't even know that. I I really don't for every, that one. Every time I think about it, the unique experience of seeing a movie at the little, it was Big Meat Eater. Did you ever see that? No, film? I didn't see that. Okay, one. this is right up your alley. Big Meat Eater is basically Sweeney Todd, set in a butcher shop, and it's a musical. And it's a, so it's a horror comedy musical called Big Meat Eater, and a, and a, all I remember from the lyrics is the one say, "I'm a big meat eater." Yes, I am. I'm a big meat eater. Pass the ham. And we're sitting there, my friends at the time, this is, you know, again, time traveling back to the early 80s, and we are dying okay, laughing Okay, you can knock movie. it off. We're we, both <laughs> old, okay? Leave me alone. <laughs> so, I felt, though, I'll tell you, my, my dear friend Adriana, my really great friend Greg Donaldson, I saw them uh, a couple days ago, and I had this moment. I'll confess, I confess, I confess. This is how old I am. I confess that I'm talking to Adriana, and all of a sudden I think, you know, you're like minus seven when I first met Greg. <laughs> and the rest of the night, I was the dude from Up. <laughs> but um, so we're sitting there watching this film and you talk about, you know, some people love things and some people hate it. And it and it was up there with Bubba Hotep. If you've ever seen Bubba, Hotep. I own it. <laughs> yeah, you own it. So. So um, uh, anyway. We're dying laughing. My one friend, Nanette, is like, she just gets up and goes, this movie sucks, and she walks out. And we were, we were like, this is the funniest thing we've seen in ages. It was, it was, I've got to go it was, through that was That was my moment at the Little Theater where it was not only m- completely memorable, you never would. I've never seen that movie anywhere other than the. Middle. I've never heard of that one. Yeah. You got me. It sounds like Delicatessen a little bit. A lot, a little like, bit. A lot like Delicatessen. But my most memorable, actually, and I'll do a little like humble brag. My friend Beth Bailey's filmmaker, local filmmaker, and I helped produce some of her films. We had a red carpet premiere at the Eastman, and I'll loan you. I have a copy of the movie. I'm getting personal, and we had it was cool. We had the red carpet. We all came. We had a party at the Little afterwards. Mm-hmm. Actually, I think it was at Milestone. Yeah, it was at Milestone back in the day. And it was really cool. But that actually was not my number one. That was, like, number two. And I had, like, a friend come up to me. I'm going to go to this movie. Like, you know I produced it. <laughs> Sweet. No, I'll let you I'll, I'll like, loan you a copy of it. It's actually it's fairly good. We, like, you know, it's like one of those good old relationships. I have a cameo. You have a cameo in a like lot of Hitchcock. people's movies. <laughs> but but that was not you've my got, you've kind of got that profile. That was not my most memorable moment at the Eastman for movies though. My most memorable one I've ever seen there. There were two, okay, I'll give two of them. Okay, one's a positive, one's a negative. We'll do the. This negative. is at the Eastman. This is at the Eastman. The negative was Solo, 120 Days of Sodom, which is this movie. <laughs> it's a Pasolini movie. Pasolini. I'll show you the effect of this movie. A guy murdered him after the movie, ran him over, came back and ran him over again. He was so pissed at the movie. And it's a movie he was banned for years. He fell under the car twice. It was banned for years. I guess I guess it was a criterion collection, but his family went so it was like if you wanted to get it, you'd have to like, you know, shout like hundreds of like hundred bucks or whatever. But it was this movie, the Nazis take over this house in Italy during World War Two and they do all these sadistic stuff with these young kids. It's based on a Marquis de Sade story. Wow. And it's one of those I almost I almost lost it a couple times. And okay, for us now, what they say a lot's probably more worse, but some of the scenes it just I remember people walking out and my friend Kevin Wilcox will love him. He'll be on sometime. He's in Vegas now, great friend of mine. He goes, that guy with the eyes, the cross eye I had nightmares about this guy. But, you know, sometimes you just got to see it because you hear about it so much. It's like watching a train wreck. You can't take your, you can't avert your gaze. Yeah. And I own his, actually, Arabian Nights trilogy. That's really good. But mm-hmm. this was like his dark trilogy. So, but now the, the the other one, the other one that I think I never seen more people enjoy it more and laugh more and get the kick. And one of my friends is a priest and I told him about it. He got the humor in it. Was Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> And again, I own it if you want to borrow it. I want to borrow that. And it just was done. It has lesbians. It has Jesus coming back to fight his masked wrestlers. So so I I got to dig this up. But somewhere in, in my 
archives. I've got a, a little bingo card that I made, which was how to make the perfect cult film. And we based it on um, um, Repo Man. And it was and it was all of the different elements that you needed to have to have the perfect cult film. It was you had to have aliens, you had to have vampires, uh, werewolves, or or other um, uh, lycanthropes. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Shapeshifters. Shapeshifters. Or... shapeshifters uh, uh, crypto uh, creatures, uh, right? Uh, cryptozoology things going on. The goat um, sucker, Bigfoot, or something. Yeah. Oh, and, he and gives... then and then punks. Yes. Cars. Right. Um. Um, oh, what else? We had a we had a whole bingo card of these well, things. Well, uh, it's like you, you basically pick one from each of the the five columns, <laughs> and you end up with the perfect. Column. Well, it's called Odessa Films. It's out of Canada. I, I saw Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter and twice, and the director came, and it was one of the funniest things because the head the star of it came. He was sloshed. You could just tell he was. You could tell he was. So he was at the theater. You're saying they came after they, they uh. came back. It did so well the first time he came back. So the director came. And they talked about, and I knew this from like working with films with Beth Zinko films, our thing. How long doing like call it guerrilla filmmaking, trying to raise the money, and that's one of the reasons we stopped was just trying it was just too hard. Mm. But he would say like you know all everybody works, you got to shoot on weekends, you got to find a place to shoot, and it would take. Like, but his other movie was Harry Knuckles in the Pearl Necklace. <laughs> it's a scene, and this hit I own that. <laughs> Just, you want to fast forward the gerbil scene with the wrestler, but uh, I own that too if you'd like to borrow it. But it has Bigfoot in it. See, and my friend watched it. He so goes, like "Bubba Hotep." I mean, yeah. that's got all, that takes all. It's got Elvis in well, it. Well, right? you you know, like I always say about Texas, how we love Texas, as we do. We love parts of Texas. I always say, well, but I always say, we love okay, Austin. somebody was complaining about Texas their politics. They go, "You can't get rid of them though, because Jarl Lansdale is one of my favorite authors, mm -hmm. and he's like one of us too in terms of like all this. But he's like the best summer read, and Bubba Hotep's one of his short stories. Right? If you get the DVD, he reads it. Oh, really? Yeah, he's like, he reads it on there, like this one, and he's got this voice, he's like a guy, I guess what he does for his stories is he sits out on his porch, and he talks, it's like, almost like a guy sitting around a fire. Telling a story. And he's like, perfect, because you can read, like, okay, next year, Orlandsdale novel's out, 300 pages, get down, you got two hours? And I love his stuff. I'd actually like to do a Zoom with him, I've like been a big fan of his for years. Yeah, he's, he's, he's great writing. But, but he but, grants but, everything. He does, like, that's what he does. He takes every genre and sticks it in there. It's the bingo card, I'm telling you. But, yeah, we had a country music one. It was just easy. Your dog died, your liver failed, your truck died, your wife left you. I, I've I've sung you the shortest country song in yeah. history, right? It's so lonesome in the saddle since my horse died. <laughs> oh, goodness. You know what that's from? What? Gong Show. Oh, I used to watch that. He couldn't get gonged. It was too short. He was done. It was so he he won. He won the gong show with that song. Oh, because they're all ready to get him, and it's like the, the, he, they didn't have time to gong him. <laughs> no, but I'm thinking I've seen a lot of like the little. Actually, one of the movies I really and I don't have like a number one, but I really love. I've seen this movie. I actually went to the theater in Pittsburgh to see it again. I just so I love how things are put together. And there's a movie called Tim's Vermeer. Don't know. And what it is, they actually had a. It's about, okay, Penn Jillette, Penn and Teller. He gets a guy who's like this brilliant polymath these days, and I don't know the guy's name, but he's like one of these guys done everything. Like he's like a scientist, physicist. So Vermeer has this painting, and they're trying to figure out how did he do this with the way that the – like it looks 3D. Mm -hmm. So his challenge, the, the guy's name's Tim, was can you produce it the way Vermeer did it without using how he would do it in the day? And it Got shows it. how he puts it together, and I was fascinated by it. We'll have to watch that. That sounds like right up my alley. And what it was, what they had like some art critics afterwards doing on there, and also one of the, I will say, like I'm very involved with theater, obviously. And you never met MJ. You met I don't know if you met Pat. He's our Zoom guy. Mm -hmm. But MJ did one. Let's kill Shakespeare, out by Star Alley at Lux. But they also had the uh, they did a reading of a. With the comic, the comic book author did a comic book with all the Shakespeare villains as villains, and all the Shakespeare heroes as heroes. And I want a villains T-shirt. I'll wear it sometime. Maybe I'll wear it out to Lily. That <clears throat> I want because he asked a question, and I was going, "Ha ha! They're all theater people. I'm the comic person. I'm gonna kick butt." And they asked the really, and it's actually <laughs> they asked the a question. Comic crossover there. They asked, uh, 
name three comic book movies where the hero doesn't have superpowers. And a woman goes up, she gets it wrong. I just go, want me to name ten? <laughs> wow. And I just did it, and then I got the shirt. I got the pick. He's like, heroes are villains. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, totally go for the villains. Yeah. Is that us getting chimed off? <laughs> That's, I'm still hoping, like, I still have this thing. I'm still hoping somebody call, like, somebody calls me so we can just put them on. But can you name three? No. Jill, you, you can't name three with no superpowers? It's not that hard. Is that a... Comic book movies, movies with the hero doesn't have a superpower. Well, I got all pretend, I got all pedantic because I was gonna. You could actually well, say, well, ba- well, Batman, ba- yeah, okay. But you could say Iron Man because he's a guy in a suit. But I didn't go that way. I said Ghost World because it's Daniel Close comic. Road to Perdition's a comic. Oh, and Art School Confidential's well, a comic. Well, and if you're gonna go that way, I mean, it's I, a comic I, book. That's all you do. I, I, Walking Dead. Yeah, actually, yeah, there's a, but there's all the other people in yeah. it. Yeah, but I was happy somebody couldn't answer it. It was like, huh. Yeah. But that was one of the ones. But I. Wasn't put into a, um, a movie, but that's a series. Yeah, but yeah. it was a, a comic book, wasn't it? Which one? And so, no, it's a no, novel. It's Neil, no, Neil, did, that's a novel. Maybe they did a comic book version of it. They, I Neil think there is. Book, yeah, then. but there is, but it's, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, it was just a casual thing, anyways. You know, but that was really fun. I used, I miss a lot of those events because of COVID and everything. I, you know, I, I feel like this is the post-COVID show because we've been we've been not socializing much at all. But in, I just in the last few weeks, I got on a plane for the first time. I went to Chicago. I spoke at a conference. I was in a I was in a room with four hundred people. Uh, went to restaurants and everything, and did everything kind of normal. We went out and saw. We were the only ones wearing masks. I think there were six people wearing masks at uh, Jason Bonham uh, a couple of weeks ago. Well, last weekend. Yeah. Um, and oh. and you know we were we were, we went to the uh, Van, we went to the oh by the way if you haven't had a chance go to the yeah, Van Gogh. How Gove was thing. it? What's your review? We went to the Van Gogh Beyond. Van I'm all Gove. ears. Well, I'm one ear. Well, or we Van Gogh. Late last night and it was. And we we went at eight thirty and by the time we got in the immersive room there were maybe twenty people in there, and. By the time we left, we were the only two other than the uh, other than the, the the workers there, mm-hmm. and um, and we didn't know this until we were out of the room. It, it, I think they shut it off about maybe a minute after we walked out of the room. I, I I felt it's going to be weird if I'm in here and the lights go off or all the lights go on. But what happens at the end of the show is they project a grid onto the floor that they use to align all the projectors in the immersive room. So we highly recommend if you get a chance to go see this, get get in and stay through the last show because it's a 37 minute loop at the end and wait till they they shut it off and the grid comes on so you can see the grid because we missed that and we heard about it after the fact i just would have liked the thing it's like some of you got locked in and then i had to go get you for this (laughs) (laughs) that's my that's my daughter's uh uh, biggest uh, nightmare lucy she always got worried about getting locked in the museum or the zoo or the department store or whatever as she was a kid and i'm like Night at the museum. Come on. One of my friends got locked in Mount Hope <laughs> Cemetery one time. How could you get locked in? There's so many holes in the fence. We used to sneak in. <laughs> uh, oh, I know. U of R. I mean, I remember like U of R. There was a story. You went to U of R. Yeah, I went know? to U of R, yeah. Okay, have you heard this story? <clears throat> Around Halloween, I never saw it. Don't know if it's true. They always said there was a bat's nest like in the middle of there, and they would all go shake it up. I've now I've heard the story. I never saw one. I never, I never heard about that, but... Um, I knew that people used to, you know, break into mausoleums and do things and at, at night. But we just, it, it was a shortcut for us, right? Because it was, you know, you're surrounded on two sides by a river and the other side of the triangle by the cemetery. And, and it was always the shortest distance between there and, 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 you know, South Avenue. So if we were walking over to South Ave, we would just cut through. And we knew where all the gaps were in the bars, the, the iron fence, where people would pry them up and just walk through the fence and cut across and walk through and. I used to know that place like the back of my hand. And and when uh, Jill first moved to Rochester, we used to walk our dog over there. So I got to know it intimately again just from walking Holly over there. But. Yeah, it's all that's cool. I used to like old cemeteries and exploring them and everything. you got to find the elephants. Yeah, there's like Mercy Brown. If you ever go to Rhode Island, it's supposed that only American vampires buried in Rhode Island, Mercy Brown. Mm-hmm. 
and I had the freaky one. I think I told this story. I was down there visiting a friend. There's two stories, but there's Mercy Brown, the only American vampire. There's Nellie Vaughn, who supposedly, she was some Confederate woman, right? And I suppose if you go up to her grave, and say she's, she'll pop up and say, I'm perfectly pleasant. So I'm like <laughs> standing there at dusk, right? And I look over, and there's a young woman in Confederate garb talking next to me, talking. And I'm just okay. Was she real or was she? There was a some kind of celebration. Oh, was a great actor. They were all like, <laughs> <laughs> but for you know, for a minute for where you go, split second, you're like, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm Bruce Willis from that movie, and I don't want to be Bruce Willis from that movie. <laughs> but the other one I saw good with. I mean, going to like the little too was like a treat because remember then too, it's like a lot of these movies they would just pass through. And, like, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. Oh, so, gosh, yeah. Yeah. Great film. Yeah. Uh, City of Light was another great film. Um, but, yeah, The, the Adventures of Baron Mun- von Munchausen was, was awesome film. And I saw there's a couple. There's, oh, I can't even remember. Oh, the one, uh, The Angel Share, which I think you'd love, too. It's right up your alley. I've, I've heard about this film a you couple of times. You know what The Angel Share is? It's, it's scotch. It's, it's, well, it's, it's, it's any whiskey. It's the, it's the bit of after when, you, when you've cast it that disappears. It's the loss of volume that happens in the cask. And it's referred to as The Angel's Share. It's what, it's what sort of, you know, disappears in the cask. And, and, you you allow for it when you're um, when you're sampling the the casks when you're uh, tasting them during aging, uh, but you have to you have to also take into account that there's the angel share and then there's how much you remove from the cask when you're tasting it over time as it's aging, but um, and then whatever else is gone somebody obviously pilfered from the cask. <laughs> I the, missed my call. But the angel share, yes. But I went with a friend of mine and she had, had just been to Scotland, right? So. It was cool because it was filmed all there. She's pointing out. I walked over there. Was this our Heather Stewart? No, this was somebody else. Oh, somebody else. Okay. Oh, she was like, she was funny like the last time I saw because she was saying, somebody pointed out like a statue at uh, Eastman. She, I was in Italy. I've seen, I lived in Italy. I've seen them all over. <laughs> I love like the random comments. You get, oh, yeah. <laughs> Jaded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that. But I always like, I do like if I go to classic concerts, I still love the one person I saw wearing a Guns N' Roses shirt to a classic concert. That's why I wore like my punk hoodie. Because <laughs> it's like, I want to get kicked out of here. I want to be a rebel. <laughs> Everything. But I do all that. Them, that. That actually shows right there. I actually, one of the things Heather and I do a lot, go to ballets and. Our favorite, her favorite. I don't know if I have a favorite, but it's all I wish we could, was the Blood Countess, mm. and that was, it was fantastic. But this shows my musical taste. When it, after the Blood Countess, I went off to a punk show. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be diverse. And I remember my friends in the band there, and I wrote something to them saying, "Well, I got to. Well, why, why are you going to be late? I'm going to a ballet." And they go, we love your diversity <laughs> and everything. But that's what that's what we've always said on this show that. You know, it's just good music and bad music. But you have to give everything a try, right? And you might not like it. I mean, that's like some stuff, you know, and then like fads. I mean, I know like, at least from Adriana being probably three or four years younger than me. Uh, she, uh, but I've gotten into a lot of that. I still don't get the vibe as much for the electronic music. Mm. But like, you know, one of our running jokes with Greg is the Billie Eilish stuff. The Billie Eilish. I, I, you know, I couldn't pick Billie Eilish out of a lineup. <laughs> yeah, you could. She's like probably, you know, and when I'm walking, anybody about 20 getting out of school, <laughs> you know, about going by up there, like walking by is Billie Eilish. Right. But I mean, I, I watched it one night, Austin City Limits, because she was on, and I didn't like the music, but she seems like she connects with the fans and she's got her bass and stuff. It's like some bands, like I know here, that I've heard, like that, like, and I know, like, some friends of mine, like Jim Cotta. Like a lot, mm-hmm. and I can't really judge them because I've heard like one song, but I just don't really like that electronic music. And I was a big Sisters of Mercy fan. Mm-hmm. I even saw them at the Ritz in New York. Right. So, but I just can't get into that. You know, it's funny. We we went to see um, uh, the Stickman. You you were there, um, and um, uh, you know our friend Steve Piper was there. And Steve yeah, that was a good way just to pretend to take a picture of them because you wanted my hat. I could have just given you to take a picture. <laughs> oh, you must tell the story of tentacles. 
if you remember. I'll tell the story of Tentacles in a second. Yeah, yes. but, it, but what was interesting is you talk about you know being diverse with music. And Steve's you know songwriter, um, Americana and folk um, does some rock, uh, but you know he's really kind of a folk and Americana guy. And he said, you know, it's it's interesting. He said, I wouldn't have picked this concert, right, um, uh, to, to go see Tony Levin and, and co. But he said he really enjoyed it. He loved the, you know, the instrumentation was just brilliant. The electronic drums mixed in with the, the, the you know, the, the conventional drums, right, the acoustic drums. But he said, you know, you'd think if, if somebody asked you about this music, it's the sort of thing that a broody teenage boy would listen to in his room with his headphones on and, and you know we're all dressed in black. My little snippy yeah. comment one time to a friend of mine, I felt sort of because I dated like a one of uh, okay. We used to go to Club X and we used to go to X. all. Okay, you picture the girl already, the kind of person, goth, the goth girl, yeah. yeah. And I had this one snippy thing she said to me one time. This was in college, but I, but she's like, "Do you like the Cure?" And I said, "Last time I looked, I wasn't a mopey fourteen-year-old girl." <laughs> oh, 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 but I love The Cure. <laughs> I do, too. The, the weird part is now I really like them, but I was, like, being one of those more hipper-than-thou types then. Yeah, but we used to go to Club all, X all the time. Let's all dance the Joy Division, right? Yeah, Joy Division and all this stuff. But I like that stuff. But, no. but you know, with, I mean, Steve's point was that the, the music was really intricate, and there was a lot to it, and he really enjoyed it, right? So as yeah. a musician, he was able to relate to it. And I think that's the that's the point it is, you know, good music, music communicates, musicians communicate soul to soul, right? And and a musician to audience is soul to soul. And and you either it either speaks to your soul or it doesn't speak to your soul. And I think there's a stereotype, too. The, we can do stereotypes of if you think the most gaudy crap, whatever John would think. Like, if you think, if, like, Prague, the overkill the real like flatulent and i'll tell you the best story i ever heard rick wakeman when they would do like journey to the center of the mind whatever mm. he wore a hood right he wore like a cloak yeah he said because the song was like like almost a half hour he would get curry and eat during the song yeah but you know like when spinal tap does stonehenge you just think right. of like this is like pretentious prog satire right but the thing is, you know, and I've told you my theory, and it's just, it is what it is. I said, like, okay, if you're Americana, you don't have to be the greatest player, but you have to have a heart. You should like your songs. Yeah. But, like, I think if, like, you're a musician and you're like, I really want to challenge myself, you want to do prog. You want to do progressive, yeah. Yeah, and, like, the funny part right. was, like, 10, but this is how, like, okay, oh, I'll so, give you, but, so, okay, like, okay, you do, like, say you think, like, a really good Americana song, you're, like, almost crying or, like, yay, because of the lyrics. But when you're doing a prog rock song, all you have to do is go boom, 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 tentacles. Yes. <laughs> but how did you, and those are the lyrics. So you so, too can write the lyrics so, for a prog so, rock song. So Tony, so, so so for those of you that don't know, Stickman is Tony Levin and... Um, um, two other guys. Two other guys, Marcus and Patrick, uh, are both very gifted musicians. And, and Marcus makes uh, electronic instruments. He'll, he'll make touch-style guitars and, and touch-style basses. So Tony plays a Chapman stick. And he was, so Marcus made Tony a bass, and he sent it to him. And Tony was expecting it to be a U8, an eight-string bass, and the, the model's called a U8. So he's, he's, he's just going to, his plan is, I'm going to open the box, I'm going to take it out, I'm going to tune it to itself, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play something and record it and send it to the guys. So, so, he, so he, first he pulls it out and sees that it's a 10-string, not an 8-string, because he's already planning to call it You Ate It. In fact, he was going to call the song You Ate It Ralph after the Alka-Seltzer commercial. So then he's now he's got this ten string thing. So he so he's playing something and he and he's and he's thinking I could call it. He said worst idea I ever had it was call it utensils, and and that was awful. So he didn't and he finally called it tentacles, and so he's playing this incredible song and just stops and he goes tentacles, and then he and then he plays on. I I mean I could go I'd be like I talk about like a fanboy crush on Tony, Tony Levin's like one of my heroes for music. And he's and just I, and it goes beyond that though because if you've ever met him and I'm not friends with them but I would say if he sees me he knows what I am because who I am because I've seen him over the years but he's just also what you want because he's so talented but he's like the nicest most humble guy he's too. just incredibly approachable and actually almost a little uh shy on well stage. he can't you know he can't hear a little i know he's got hearing problems what? i know yeah <laughs> <laughs> you're learning the humor my boy Jill never but the thing with tony like too is i was telling him like you know i said i but i guess i said one time like i 
you're like up like Jacko Pastore says, don't even compare me to him. Yeah. And then I said, well, you know, in one way I won because I told him the story when Jacko played Red Creek. They couldn't find him and they found him now urban legend. Other people have told it's I'll tell basically what it, the general that's true. They couldn't find him. They found a pastor on the railroad tracks and covered in yellow paint. <laughs> now the color of the paint has been confused. You know, Jocko had some issues. Yeah. But you know, Tony obviously doesn't. Yeah. But Tony's just the kind of guy that but I love his story where he, like that, that one time he comes in I think he lives by Woodstock. Or he yeah, did. he lives near uh, Kingston, uh, Woodstock, somewhere yeah. in that vicinity. Uh, it's like a snowy night in January. He drives in for a benefit at a Penfield church. Mm -hmm. Fantastic concert. And Tony's Tony. He'll stay and talk, whatever, at the end. Yeah. And number one, my best story for him comes later where I showed him a copy of a book I his. He's, he takes these signs because you know I don't see these much anymore. Here I signed to go sell it, <laughs> but and that was like the night my dad died after, and it just gave me soulless. I got to see him before, and I was telling him that. But this was so he's playing, and he'll stay and talk to everybody. But yeah. he tells the story. He goes, he's telling the story of Peter Gabriel working with the little gr the little apes in the studio. But he says Peter calls me. It's like, hey, do you have time? I need somebody for a really small show I'm doing, like a club show. Uh, you know, Peter, I'd like to. I but I've got doing these other things. I've got some cream 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 stuff. Okay, it'll be it'll be on. He looks on. Peter Gabriel's playing in front of four billion people worldwide for the Olympics. Wow! And he just tells him that. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to tell him the story I've told many times out here because it's my one Peter Gabriel story. My friend Sammy does the security for the War Memorial and how Peter likes to bike, and Peter's biking around. And Sammy's like, you know, job. I'm jogging with him. I get back to the little shed, and I'm, <laughs> you know, and Peter Gabriel's laughing at me. And I'm like, and he's like, what are you laughing at? He's like, no, for the whole tour, you only, for sure, you're the first security guy who made it the whole way. <laughs> and Tony was like, yeah, that's really funny. And you know, Tony likes to sing in a barbershop quartet. Yeah. But we'll get him here some way, some he's, he's got the mustache for it. Yeah, and the thing I've been telling, he's like 76 this year, and it's got to be a love of what you do. I'm sure he does not need the money. He just must love to love and play. I, I like the fact that they opened in Rochester. That meant a lot, right? So they, I mean, you He's know, got a big connection. He's not from here. Right, no, he's but, got he's, a big but, he, connection but he's, here. he's an Eastman grad, right? Yeah. Played in the RPO, and yeah, yeah so he's got, he's got uh, ties here. And but, I told him, yeah, I told him, like, Tony, you realize, like, the first time I saw you was... Peter Gabriel's security tour, who's mm -hmm. the one with Game of the Frontiers. I saw you, and I just going, that's a really cool bald dude playing bass. <laughs> and it's like, that was like, what, 40 years? Three years ago. <laughs> 40, <laughs> but, I, but the thing I remember ago. about that show, too, was the opening band with these. Like, Peter would just, he'd like, you know, get, it was like some, it was like African band. They would bang trash cans. Mm -hmm. I quite enjoyed it. Yeah. But, like, he would just, he but he would just come out. And he would just pop out like, whatever, come yeah. out and introduce him. Just so mellow. Yeah. But I just love Tony. So, yeah. But we've blown through like an hour already. Oh. I think this is the longest show we've done in a while. Oh, like, so see how we can do on the spot. We're going to have a treat. Paul's not going to sing again. That's the biggest treat. <laughs> you going to play live for us sometime? I'll play live for you sometime, sure. So, I'll have to bring the boys in. But we're going to actually do a little different. I don't different... think it all fit in the studio, honestly. Yeah. Well, we've had three, like three people playing. Yeah. But we're going to actually do something I'll different. Have to, I'll have to go acoustic. Yeah. Well, we've done electric acoustic. Whatever. <laughs> but we're going to actually do two songs tonight because we have we don't get a chance to do these shows that often. We usually have a musician. So we have one. My friend Greg Townsend just put out an album. It's called Beyond the Horizon. Great art by Allison Cote. You can awesome, pick it up on awesome High Tide. Awesome artwork. You can pick it up on High Tide. This is Allison Cote right here. You yes. see somewhere. You can pick it up on High Tide Records. You know the good old K Todd Bradley, who actually uh, promo. He's going to be having an album CD release at Record Archive this Friday, and I'm playing. I'm going to go pick up a copy, and he's it's called Corelli and Dreams, and he's playing on this. And also Caitlin Moss and Caitlin Greg told me she's a drummer for an up and coming band in L.A. And also Yolanda Marvell, who's a guitarist he met in Chile. Cool. And it's all acoustic stuff. And I actually, from the Susan Turfler film question, I asked Greg, he said it's really hard to come up with titles for these things. Yeah. But go pick it up. It's really cool. And we're going to play. I asked Greg what song to play. And he said to play the one called Day Like Today. 
So we're going to play that. But also, and if you have yours sitting around, because I have it here, are my good friend, I have it. No, I got it right here. You don't need it. My friend Kim Draheim, I have the pre-ordered special prestige edition. So, boo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, but yours has got, you have a pre-release. It's got an extra track that whenever it's released, they're not going to have. So, oh, cool. Yeah, you're special. And he's going to email me the liner notes. Cool. So it's called uh, Message to the Youth of America with the best cover you could ever see. Yeah, I... And go pick it up from Kim. It's only 10 bucks. It's great. Yep. And I can't remember. Just... Kim's been on the show. Basically, take a little mixer. I'll, I'm, let's see what you listen to. It. Every album's different. Yeah. It's everything you could think of. But Kim said, play the first song is great. The little baby on the background. Or Tur whatever. Tourettes. It's called Tourettes. 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 I'm only playing. It's not my fault if I pronounce it wrong. <laughs> so looking forward to tons of shows ahead and Greg coming back so we can make fun of him. Unless you're not going to take up the drums, are you? I don't know. Jill wants to take up the drums. I, I, you know. Another Ringo star. <laughs> <laughs> On that, I better leave before she throws that CD at me. <laughs> Thanks a lot for listening. We'll see you very soon. Bye-bye. See you next time. Bye.
river near City Hall. Never at rest, always in motion. In uniform at the edge of the ocean. Keeping track of the facts to put in the ledger Ripping up the maps to the buried treasure Them flush to the sewer through an iron grate. 